Hello, and welcome to our lecture today on the rituals of Muharram. And what our topic is going to be is Islam in a South Indian village, specifically in the village of Gugudu in uh, Andhra Pradesh. So I wanted to take us to India because I always want to go to India, but I also want to look at Islam again because Islam is usually not very well treated in world religions course. What is especially not well treated is Islam in South and Southeast Asia. Now there are actually more Muslims living in South Asia than there are in the Arabic world all put together. So while we always think of Islam in the sense of uh, in, the, in the Arabic world and the Middle East, in fact, we should probably be thinking of Islam equally, if not moreover, in uh, South and Southeast Asia. There, are, Like I said, there are more Muslims there, in fact. So in South India, we're looking at Andhra Pradesh in a town called uh, Gugudu. As you see on this map, Andhra Pradesh is sort of this coastal range that is on the east side of India in the Bay of Bengal. Um, Yes, and you may remember we read about those Brahmins and their encampment, and they were in the East Godavari area. So that would be, as you can see here, um, up just up in sort of the, the northern part of uh, Andhra Pradesh. Um, so Muharram, the festival we're going to be talking about today, is practiced throughout the Islamic world and also throughout South Asia, Southeast Asia, but or South Asia. But generally, when we think about Muharram when it's described, even in Andhra Pradesh, it's in the town of Hyderabad, which is a, a very big, uh, is a very big city in Andhra. Um, but this is a little different. We're going to see that the festival is sort of unique, especially in the way it's done in Gugudu and the way that it blends Hindu. Uh, and Muslim not only practices, but Hindus and Muslims both practice this festival together. And it's really hard to sort out just who is who, just from looking to see what's going on at this kind of very big festival in a somewhat small town. So what is Muharram? Well, Muharram is practiced, as I said, throughout the Islamic world. It's the narrative story of it is that it commemorates the death of various martyrs, so people who are killed for their religion, and the town of Karbala. In 680 CE, in what is now Iraq, there was a long battle in which the Imam Hussein, who was the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and all of his supporters were killed after a 10-day battle. Uh, these de descendants of the, of the Prophet were in a conflict with a caliph of the Umayyad dynasty who wanted them to swear allegiance to him, and they said no, and all sorts of bad stuff incur and uh, incurred. I wouldn't have time to get into all the details of this. Now, in fact, this battle and the remembrance of the battle sort of galvanizes the splits between the Sunni Muslims and the Shia Muslims over the authority and succession in early Islam. So who is the main person with authority? Some backed uh, Ali and the others did not. Again, this is a big split in the contemporary Muslim world. Uh, we could do a whole week on Sunnis versus Shias. So the memorial, the thing that you notice about these memor about these Muharram celebrations is they usually have big uh, religious processions on the seventh and the tenth day. So at this point, what we would think of as sort of um, we should think of this as a public ritual that commemorates a tragedy, which is the martyrs at Karbala. Now, wherever it's performed, whether it's in Gugudu, Hyderabad, or contemporary Karbala, uh, the idea is that any time people are doing this procession, that town they're in becomes Karbala. This is very much the religious imagination. So if you're doing a festival commemorating something, that space actually becomes that space. It seems kind of crazy, but you see this throughout religions. So Gugudu becomes Karbala for the people who are there. Now, Muharram, if you see about it on the news, uh, and these are some sort of graphic pictures that you'll see of it, is characterized by self-flagellation. So on the seventh and the 10th days, uh, Shia Muslims will actually, they, they, they get these sort of um, spiked flails and swords and knives and whatnot, because it's a battlefield reminiscence, and they lightly cut themselves or whip themselves, and they bleed like crazy, but they don't really usually get all that hurt. They're really superficial wounds. Um, the Muharram at Gugudu is distinct because they don't do this, and this is called Maktam. They don't do this self-flagellation there. Um, yes. Uh, in fact, 
the villages and the villagers say about their uh, type of Gugudu that are their the villagers of Gugudu say about Muharram that one of the things that makes their their festival so important and so powerful is because Hindus and Muslims equally participate in this ceremony, which is sort of wild considering in Gugudu there's only the 10% of the population is Muslim, the rest is Hindu. And in fact, none of them are Shias, but they practice that. So they would be Sunni and Sufi Muslims, but they practice this Shia practice. And it's an intriguing practice. So let's note that there's that Hindus and Muslims do not usually are not usually seen um, overlapping. They don't usually have the same rituals. But when you start to look, they do have common links in India. You do see overlaps that you wouldn't see elsewhere, uh, especially when you get out to the villages and especially when you look to the times of the past. So right off, I want to talk about um, sadhus and fakirs. So a sadhu, like you see on the right. They are renunciates, they are wanderers. Sadhu just means good. They may or may not be a part of a monastic order. Fakirs as well are sort of renunciates. They wander about, they um, practice sort of Muslim forms of uh, meditation and japa, which are terms we know. I give you the Arabic ones, but I don't have them at the top of my head. Um, zikr and, no, it doesn't matter. Uh, anyway, so um, you have sadhus um, and fakirs. So fakirs are Muslims, sadhus are Hindus. But there's some overlap in their lifestyle. And actually, you start looking, and they start going to the same pilgrimage places, um, which makes it kind of confusing because you have other groups, like, say, the Nats and the Ba'uls. Now, Nat just means lord or Nata. Now, these guys historically would take a Persian name when they're talking to Muslims and a Sanskrit name when talking to Hindus. So they themselves, despite being very much a Hindu order, and in fact, arguably they invented Hatha Yoga, um, they would dissimulate whenever it was convenient. Then you have the Ba'uls, like this fellow on the right here, who are known for being mystics and musicians. They believe in a sort of non-dualistic sense of a god, but they're is he's really ineffable. He's hard to know. The Ba'uls resist being um, referred to as Muslims or Hindus, though their stylings of music is very, um, very Muslim influenced. And you can see that they draw heavily from both Sufi, so Islamic mysticism, and uh, Hindu Tantra. These guys are still around. You can find them all over Bengal. And their music is just incredible. It's beautiful. And you have Piers and Veers. So in this, we get another little bit of overlap. So a peer, as we saw here, <laughs> um, as we saw our Kulayapa character is a peer. So a peer is a Muslim saint or holy person, but in practice, after they die, they are often worshiped at their tombs, but they're thought to continue to exist and function as a sort of like castless godlike creature sort of an intermediary between man and God. Some people say that the peers are able to, to talk to God and intercede in, before you. Some are say that the peers are able to actually um, perform sort of everything from magical rites to give you good luck, to give you protection. These are very much sort of the, the main folk deities within the Muslim world. So even if you look here all the way on the left, you can see that you have a trident, which is symbol for Shiva, but it's laid atop you know, what, what appears to be a, uh, a Dargah or a Muslim shrine. So one figure I wanted to talk to you about is um, a guy named Hader Sheikh, who's depicted here in the center. Now, Hader Sheikh has a Dargah, and that's what I have depicted on the left and the right. The Dargah is a tomb for a Muslim holy person. They're dotted all over India. You find them all the time. They're often decked out in green, have a very distinctive style of architecture. So people go to these various dargahs to pray that the saint might help them and intercede with God, or that the saint himself might help them, depending on the person. Now, this is considered unorthodox. So normative Islam would say that this is absolutely wrong, that it is haram and, one, and shirk, that one should avoid it because it's forbidden. However, this is the, the peers are, are the, and their dargahs are sort of the life's blood of um, everyday village level Hinduism. Now, Malar Kutla is an interesting place. It's in the Punjab. And during the, the, they have a very intriguing history because during the times of partition and during the times of the 1990s with the destruction of the Babri Masjid, 
they had no religious violence. They had no communal violence. And research has shown, and people of Malar Kutl will say this, it's because of the God of, of Hader Sheikh, their peer. Now, Hader Sheikh is interesting because he has Muslims will come to his shrine to pray in his shrine, but outside of his shrine, you'll find Sikhs and Hindus that will call themselves chelas, which means students, who will become possessed, possibly by Hader Sheikh even. And then they will function as oracles to do healings and do religious services. But around Melar Kotla, they have this attitude of they are a city of tolerance in which Hindus revere uh, Hader Sheikh and Muslims revere Hader Sheikh. And they say that because they both worship Hader Sheikh, that's why they've had a lack of violence in their town. I mean, it's curious because we talk so much about Muslim Hindu violence, but why don't we talk more about the sort of things that I'm talking about today, where Hindus and Muslims are not violent, where they do get along and where they do share uh, sort of ritual spaces and do, they do share um, religious figures. That, that's really intriguing to me. Maybe less, I'd like, I would like to less look at why violence happens and look more at like why it doesn't happen in other places. I think that's an important shift, especially in religious studies. So we're back to Islam. Um, so I, the, the other, oh, and the other thing that Muslims and Hindus clearly share is um, like Muharram and to some degree holy, they both practice holy. So we're back in Islam. So what are the five pillars of Islam? And by Islam here, I mean the universal Islam, Asli uh, Islam, like sort of the true Islam, um, the Islam that's recognizable no matter where you go. A lot of people would say that it's the five pillars that really unites everyone. The five pillars are declaring or professing your faith, obligatory prayer five times a day, compulsory giving to the poor, fasting during the month of Ramadan, and the Hajj, taking a pilgrimage to Mecca. Along with this, I would also say that there is a reverence for the family of the prophet that go across all different versions of Islam. Uh, yes, so um, we will actually see that the peers of uh, Gugudu are declared to be different members of Muhammad's family. And in fact, Hulayapa, the head uh, peer in, uh, in Gugudu, is thought to be his grandson, which is intriguing. Okay, so we talked about Shia and Sunnis. I'm gonna go really quickly on this. So Sunnis sort of um, do not believe in like an enduring presence of God manifesting in the world, and the Shias do. The Shias have an idea that there is a coming Imam, a coming, and, and he is uh, occluded, he's hidden in the world. And they also believe that your relationship with your spiritual teacher, also your peer, uh, is sort of modeled on, is, is modeled on and reflects the, the spirit of God that's living in the world. And yes, so let's, so Muharram is generally done by the Shias. But yes, once again, uh, in Gugudu, none of the Muslims, all the Muslims are Sunnis, but they're doing this Shia practice that they do along with their neighbors. I remain curious as to how this got started, how Muharram got started um, in Gugudu in particular. So Muharram, as I said before, it's the second most holy month under Ra after Ramadan. It's characterized by religious processions that commemorate the martyrs of Karbala. In Gugudu, Muharram is, uh, in Guguru, Muharram is called Pir La Pandiga, which means the festival of the peers, the festival of those holy figures known as peers. And um, like I said, while this is practiced everywhere in the Shia world, the villagers maintain unique traditions that actually pull from quite a bit of local Hinduism and just local culture in general. So what is a peer? As I said before, they're local religious figures in Islam. They are deceased saints. They overlap in their function and form with village deities that might be considered Hindu. They're the living face of Islam. Usually the reverence to them is focused on their dargas or their graves. Um, one person argued that these peers are Muslim saints or spiritual leaders who function like casteless spiritual beings, who function like gods. Now, Moen gives us a couple of really good uh, understandings of Islam as he tries to understand this. And it was, it's always kind of fun to read Afsar's book. Uh, he was actually one of my first Hindi teachers. And it wasn't until I was reading his book, and then I flipped and I looked at his back, the back of his, uh, and I looked at a picture of him, and I thought, oh, that's Afsar. That's, that, that was one of my first Hindi teachers. 
He was like a Hindi TA uh, in an intensive language course I took one time. So he's going to posit localized Islam and local Islam. So these are sort of his understandings of a specific dynamic in Islam. So two polarities that you see in Islam in India. When we say localized Islam, we mean normative Islam, but it's being practiced in a local context. So someone graph, what, the, what happens is you graft translocal pan worldwide Islam, like worldwide Sunni Islam, and you put it in a specific spot. So you're localizing it. So um, this could have a varied level of connection to a larger Islam. You could have a localized Shia Islam, a localized Sunni Islam. Um, we do see that religious nationalism from both Hindus and Muslims in recent years has led to uh, Muslim reformers wanting to reform Muharram in general and stop any veneration of the peers. Uh, these reforms, the villagers argue, are clearly not effective since there are so many devotees at the festival every single year. Um, so as much as sort of loudmouth ideologues want to say, this is haram, you need to not be worshiping at saints' graves, you need to not be having festivals like this, people still do it. Why? Because it's living Islam. It's living local, uh, it's living local Islam that is sort of traditionally um, put in a place and, and amongst families. So localized Islam is on the rise and it's a site of conflict. It is also, um, this is the religion, like we've been looking at sort of the religious practices of the Pir House and the Darga, but localized Islam would be the mosque that has, you know, an imam and that has religious communities that send religious authorities like the Umma and the Ulama. So localized Islam is what we would think of as, you know, normative Islam with you know imams and and uh, and their and the uh, imams in the mosque now what is local islam local islam is sort of unique or non-sanctioned islam of a particular place it's about saints it's about dargas it's about devotion to saints or even dare i say it bhakti um this is the islam as as mohan gathers um It's, Mo, it's not Mo, it's Afsar Muhammad. I'm sorry. I just bur I just broke for a second. I'm thinking of another guy I know named Afsar Mohan. So we we're talking about Afsar Muhammad. Sorry about that. Um, so this is the non-sanctioned sort of form of local Islam uh, that is the religion of our land and our actual tradition. Um, so they would even argue that the peers and local Islam is a bridge to the five pillars. It's a way to get to more translocal Islam. It bridges the the far off Islam from the Islam of uh, your very place. Now, only 10% of Gugudu villagers are Muslims, and none of them are Shias, as I said before. Some other terms, battle standard. Now, this one screwed with me when I read uh, Muhammad's book. And I'm like, battle standard? What is a battle standard? Well, a battle standard is a flag, a flag that one carries in battle. Now, in India, these are these metal frames that have a circle on it with these three points that are then decorated with cloths and whatnot. The idea would be that when um, a Muslim figure would go into battle, they would hoist a flag. They would hoist a flag that signifies who they are and also signifying their devotion to God and their desire to win. So these represent the peers, but as you read, they also sort of are the peers as these battle standards are um, sort of pro processed through the streets or they're carried through the streets. They function, when you look at them, as it, is if, it is as if you are seeing a peer. You can interact with them. So they are, in a sense, symbols of a peer, but they are also the peer themselves. Finally, we have the Pier House, uh, and here you have a picture from a devotional, uh, from a, a sort of a devotional video, which is kind of cool. So you see that the Pier House is on the right, and that's where they would keep all of the battle standards and special chests all year round, and people regularly go um, any time of the week, any time of the day, and they make offerings there in which they say the, um, in which they say verses from the Quran, and we'll have an offering of sugar to a uh, like a, a framed photograph of the battle standard of Kulayapa. And the local cleric will help them say some prayers and then they take back that blessed sugar and they uh, consume it amongst their family and whatnot or give it to friends. And they even use the word prasad and prasad is a Sanskrit word meaning grace, 
which is generally what you call whatever you get and you take from a temple. So you come and give offerings and then you take something away. The priest will give you something and it's blessed food that you eat and it's, it's like you're eating God's grace. You can see the left of the pure house is a Hindu temple, which we'll read about in just a, a little bit. Uh, and then you see in front, you see that large, those stones and all of that, what I assume is cow dung in there. That is sort of the, the where the fire pit will be during the festival. <laughs> yes. Uh, people will come to the pier house to make offerings uh, in order to revere the pier or to fulfill a vow. They will often take a darshan. Uh, darshan is the Hindu phrase for seeing. So when I go and I look at an idol or an image of God, the idea is that I'm looking at God and God is looking at me and they call that a darshan. Uh, yes. So, okay. Um, who is Kulayapa? Well, Kulayapa is a lot of things. Kulayapa is, his name literally means something like the peer who wears a hat. Um, Kulayapa is sort of the main peer of the area, and he's got a couple of levels. So locals will say that he's the eldest grandson of Muhammad, um, and argue that Hussein, who was martyred at Karbala, is his younger brother. And the argument is that uh, Kulayapa was also there at Karbala and was martyred. Uh, also, we see that there's a tale that the reverence for Kulayapa and for the Muharram ritual was said to be originally brought by a Sufi priest who was Persian named Fakhruddin. Um, so that shows this further connection to uh, Persian religion. But again, a Sufi priest or a Sufi figure who brings a, uh, a, a Shia person ostensibly though Kulayapa is clearly a, a South Indian name and then also uh, brings a festival that is a uh, festival practice that's generally done by Shias it's just sort of odd um, oh yeah so to continue the town of Gugudu Gugu is uh, as a derivation of the Sanskrit word Guha and do means like place of so like the place of or the nest of Gugu uh, who is Guha Guha is a character in the Ramayana, which is a story about the Hindu god Rama and how his wife is stolen. He has to claim her back from a demon king of Lanka. Supposedly, he needs to get across a large river before he lost his wife. So we see this picture of him there with his wife Sita and his brother Lakshman. And there's this guy who uh, lends them their boat, and his name is Guha, which means, and his name actually means something like secret or cave. So yeah, and he wears a little hat in the story. So. Kulayapa, again, the guy with the hat. A lot of guys with hats. I want to do a whole religious studies class on religious hats. Uh, yeah, so uh, Kulayapa is revered by both Hindus and Muslims, and his Muslim identity is not identified by, is not denied by the Hindus. But when you look through a lot of the videos of Muharram and Gugudu, you will actually see that there are other versions of Kulayapa who look more Hindu than Muslim. All right, so. What is Muharram? What are the events? What are the rituals? Well, this is a 13-day festival, and as I said, it's considered to be some of the purest days of the year, only slightly less important than Ramadan, the month of fasting. For the people of Gugudu, it's huge because throngs and throngs of devotees come to their village. In 2007, uh, a conservative estimate is that there were 300,000 pilgrims that have showed up. Um, now, it has some similar like time frames and similar rituals than Muharram and other cities like in Hyderabad, but it has far more temple type rituals, rituals that look a little bit more similar to Hinduism. So Gugudu is always a pilgrimage site and people come around there year round to visit with Kulayapa, but in Muharram, just significantly more people come. So the key elements that we're going to see here are fire walking, uh, darshan or site of the symbols of the pier. In fact, seeing his battle standards, as you see in the center here, that are usually locked away in his house. You'll see uh, plenty of sacrifice and ritual feasting, uh, processions in which uh, people wander through the streets carrying the battle standards, and finally a conclusion that mimics funerals and uh, preparations of the bodies of the dead. Why? Because at the end we're commemorating a martyrdom. So um, throughout this text, you're going to hear me say, oh, and then the priest says the Fateha, or the, uh, 
or the, the folk say the Fateha or whatnot. Well, the Fateha is the first sort of opening verses to the Quran, and here we see them used rit ritually. So I just wanted to read them to you real quick. In the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful. Sorry, I can't, I don't speak Arabic, so I'm not going to do you in the Arabic. Uh, all praises and thanks be to Allah, the Lord of the Alma Alamin, which is mankind, jinns, and all that exists. The most beneficent, the most powerful, the only owner and the only ruling judge of the day of, recomp of recompense, the day of resurrection. You alone we worship and you alone we ask for help for each and everything. Guide us to the straight way, the way of those on whom you have bestowed your grace, not the way of those earning, who have earned your anger, nor of those who went astray. So this is what they'd be chanting when they do the Fateha in, um, but they'd be chanting it, of course, in Arabic, it wouldn't be in Telugu. Um, the majority of the people would be speaking Telugu here, not Urdu, in fact, because we're in South India. All right, day one, uh, the Pradhana Darshana. So right off the bat, we're in a weird spot. Those are Sanskrit words. Um, darshana means sight. Like I say, when I look at God and God looks at me, that's a darshan. That's a thing. It's not really found in Islam. Even when you're talking about revering the dargas, um, it's the tomb of the saint. The saint is thought to be there. You're not looking at the saint. And the saint's not looking at you. And Pradhan just means first or give it. Okay, so Pradhana Darshana. So preparation's been going on for a while, especially they've been hauling in wood for weeks, probably. Um, the first day starts when they witness the first crescent of the new moon. So this is a lunar calendar. So they're looking for this, in the cycle of the moon, this first specific crescent of a new moon, and that's when it all begins. Okay, so the Peer House gives out a range of pamphlets at, that sort of tell the times of the ritual this year and interpret the ritual, explain the stories of it, explain the stories of Calliope. But the funny thing is they find that actually the majority of people just do what they've always done. They don't look to these pamphlets really in any sort of way. Um, then also on the first day, they pull out a chest, sort of an old chest that has all the battle standards of, um, of, Kula, of, of the different peers and an image of Calliope. And folks are really excited. They gather to see these uh, metal standards come out and the image of Calliope come out. Everybody's really pumped for that. And they want to have that first vision, that first darshan. Also, they bring forth a chariot that will transport the, the peers later in the festival. And then they put them all away till the next day. So what's on the day two? The day two is really preparation for the fire rituals. So I want to talk to you about them a little bit. And um, there are fire rituals throughout this day, throughout the um, throughout the festival, including fire walking and dancing around the fire. So the fire really becomes sort of the, the physical focus for a lot of what goes on. So all the villagers join their hands and dig out the pit, cross caste and across Hindu or Muslim. They all do this together and then they start filling that pit with wood. Now during this time, the Hindus will circumambulate the pit. So when you go into a Hindu temple, like sort of a large temple, one of the things you do is you walk sort of clockwise around the inner sanctum or you'll walk sort of uh, clockwise around the outer part of the temple and they call that circumambulating. In Sanskrit, it's called the uh, pradakshina. So circumambulation going around. So anyway, um, or parikrama, sorry, not pradakshina, parikrama. Uh, anyway, so they, uh, yes, the Hindus circumambulate the pit and the Muslims do too, but when they chant, they're chanting that Fateha, the, the verses that I just, I just uh, spoke to you just a few minutes ago. Now, folks there, um, Afsar Muhammad discovers, actually say that the thing about devotation to Kulayapa and being at Muharram is it transcends a Hindu identity and it transcends any exoteric understanding of Shiism. So if you would say, hey, is it weird that everybody's doing a Shia ritual? They say, no, no, no we're doing a Kulayapa ritual. This is beyond all of that business. Our Muharram transcends Hinduism, Islam, and whatever you want to talk about. The big thing is being devoted to Kalayapa and the peers of the area. Um, the men that do fire walks throughout this ritual, uh, they do argue that it's replacing the maqam, the, the self-flagellations. And it's also an instance where men can show and prove their strength and also to demonstrate and test their devotion. And day three, they install the peers. Here on this day, a group of people who are all considered very clean and pure and have done specific bathing sort of rituals, they pull out all the standards while chanting the Fateha, they scrub them with water, and then they dress them up in these sort of cloth costumes. 
Uh, Mohammed says that you cannot tell the difference between the battle standards before they put the costumes on. They're indistinguishable. When you look, it's just, I mean, it's a metal circle with these three points. It's really hard to tell them apart. Uh, anyway, so after they get them all dressed up, they line them up with Kulayapa at the center. Uh, okay, so days four, six, eight, eleven, and twelve. These are what are called resting days. A few things happen on them, but not that much. The idea is, is that the peers are supposed to be resting and you shouldn't bother them. They're all present in the village and they're everywhere around, but just leave them alone on those days. They're taking a break. Uh, yeah, so uh, a lot of folks on these days do what they call Nitya Fateha, which is a chanting of the Fateha, usually accompanied with the burning of incense. I'll talk about that more in the specific one ritual they do in a minute. On day four, there's also a practice that Muhammad discovered that uh, women will go to an area in their specific neighborhood, sort of stand in a circle and sing and dance, pretending that there's a fire pit in the middle. And they're dedicating their devotion to Fatima, who is the daughter of the prophet, who is thought to bring them good luck and take care of them specifically as women during the year. Day five. Oh, there's day four, <laughs> day four. There are women and um, Muhammad's, uh, Muhammad's daughter, Fatima. Day five is, a, they do a ritual called Sari Getu, which is cordoning off the city. This is where people wander around uh, and mark out the village in small processions. In fact, day five commemorates the first martyrdom of, of the two, of the first martyrs at Karbala. In fact, the two sons of Zainab uh, are killed on that day. Now we're coming into the big day. Big day is big. Big day is day seven, where lots of stuff happens. So day seven commemorates the martyrdom of Kasim, who is the 13-year-old recently married son of Imam Hussein. Um, and this was also the day that water was cut off from Hussein and his followers. So because that they would have been suffering from thirst in Karbala, folks do rituals to feed people and to give them water. So it's a very busy day. They also do the China Sarigatu. Um, the China, I don't know how to say Sarigatu. I don't really, I used to know a little delegate, but I don't anymore. Um, which, but I do know China, which means like little. Uh, okay, so the little procession. This is the first time the peers actually wander around the city. You've seen them around, they're at the pier house, they might have come out a little bit. This is the first big procession is on the seventh day. So on this day, people think that they actually, the peers actually come and live in the houses where they go by. So every little, uh, the peers will stop in the procession around different houses. And the idea is that the peers come to life and come into the house and continue to reside there. So the peers are now really active in the world during the festival. There's an escalation of it's like they're steadily waking up and then you're seeing the standards, getting your first vision, then they come by your house and then they're stuck, stuck to be like living in your house. So everybody would get, be getting more and more excited because they're there and they're alive. Uh, all right, so what else happens on this? Women begin doing a three day fast and men do a practice called fakiri in which they are temporary ascetics. This is a really interesting thing that we just don't have to, not have time to get into. But many, many men will actually uh, go and buy a red sacred thread. They have it blessed by the cleric at the pier house. Then they tie it on, uh, onto their arms usually, <laughs> or around their, or as a sash, like you can see here. And from that point on, they're temporary ascetics. So they try to, they, they avoid all material and sort of sexual endeavors. And for three days, they live as if they are renunciates. Intriguingly, these are practices done by Muslims, but a fair amount of Hindu and men do these same vows and do these same practices. Now this short procession is only three hours long only, which is short compared to the 10th tenth, uh, tenth day when they do a procession that goes all night. Uh, at the end of this first uh, Chinna Sarigatu, um, you may do a brief fire walk. So that means that you know, they smooth out the fire and then those people who are holding the battle standards who are in fact considered to be like the peer in that moment, do the fire walk. And it's, it's as if the peers are doing the fire walk. Man, I wanna go to this festival. <laughs> okay, so um, at, at the next one, we have a procession that goes all night. This is the big day, uh, final 10. These days, uh, they, they conclude, and we actually have a ritual funeral on the 11th. And at the end of this day, the peers are thought to be martyrs. 
So um, on the 10th day is the day where everyone was martyred at Karbala once upon a time in the seventh century. Um, after, after they are martyred, the peers will actually be put back into their homes for the coming year. Uh, as we get toward the end in these last final rituals, uh, you'll see that folk feel so connected to the peers um, in the last like 10 days, and they're really sad that that's going to end. And when you look at like, and when you look at it here, look at this picture, this looks, looks like a heck of a good time. All right, so they build up the fire pit really, really big, like bigger than they've had it before. And then at 5 uh, p.m., this is on the 10th day, the cleric comes out, the cleric from the peer house comes out and reads the Fateha, and then he lights it up. Everybody else around chants the Fateha as the fire uh, gets big. Um, right then at that point, lots of people from all over the place start singing and dancing and having folk performances from reenacting legends of the village, to stories about Goliath, to stories about the different peers. So there's all sorts of folk performance all around the different areas by the fire. Different, different villages, of course, represent different folk traditions, but they all claim that they're the most authentic. So that's how it goes. Finally, they have the big procession in which large red umbrellas are pulled out and they, the people bearing the umbrellas then go and find the people that are going to carry the uh, battle standards and they proceed to have the umbrellas follow the people who are gonna carry the battle standards to a sacred well where they bathe. Then they go back home, still with the umbrellas, put on their fancy costumes, and then they go and they pick up the battle standards and they, with the umbrella folks and tons of people playing music, these long horns called, um, what's that called? Nadi uh, Swara. Yeah, so you'll see them in the videos. Anyway, so the, um, these, the, the peers who are in, in the battle standards, they then go all around the village and they go everywhere. Now, uh, folk clamor all over the place to see this sort of last vision of the peers and to get blessings that come in the, found, uh, in the form of, of special powdered sugar uh, gifts that the carriers of the battle standards will give out to people. Uh, finally, the peers, after wandering the town, come back to the fire pit, and this can be like, this is probably around daybreak at this point, and they do tons and tons of fire working, uh, fire walking. The cleric walks the fire, then all the peers, then Kulayapa, um, then all the people do, and at the end of this, the peers go back in the peer house, and they cover them up with red cloth, because they're martyrs now. That's the end on the 10th day. Everybody dies on the 10th day in the story. So there are some events that happen on the concluding day. So there's extensive sacrifice and feasting all day on the 11th. Um, Officer Muhammad describes his white tennis shoes being stained bright red because there's so much blood all around the pier house where you have uh, people sacrificing goats and sheep and then cutting them up and serving them because there's gonna be a great amount of feasting very soon. Around 4 p.m., they do a final fire walk and darshan of the battle standards. And then they are hidden for the next year. There's going to be no more darshans. In this last little bit, when the peers are moving around, uh, women will actually pour water at their feet, and some women will even roll on the ground uh, around them. Um, and this being wet and rolling on the ground is actually something you see in other elements of South Indian bhakti as sort of a way to show your... Uh, devotion to the Lord. Finally, we have the last day, uh, which is called Akri in Urdu, which means something like the end, but it's called Jaladi in Telugu, and Jaladi just means put it in the water or immerse it in water. So at this point, the piers are marched out to a dried up well that corresponds to the water source that would have been there in Karbala. Once there, uh, the people who are carrying the piers will actually remove their costumes um, and they will wash the battle standard uh, very vigorously, um, and then the cleric will give a very special, and then they wander back to the pier house, and the cleric gives a special prasad of a specific type of cooked bread, and then um, everybody who's been making food makes a little chunk of their food and gives it to the peers, makes an offering, and then they feast, and it's delightful, and the peers are put away for the rest of the year. All right, so what are some everyday practices when it's not Mohara? Well, there's 
two or three that I want to talk about really briefly. First, you have Nitya Fateha, and this is weird, again, also, because you have Fateha, but Nitya means like ever-present, always. Um, a Nitya Puja is a Puja that you do every day. So when they say Nitya Fateha, they're pulling on this Sanskrit term for like a Nitya Puja, a Nitya ritual, which is like the bare minimum ritual that you have to do absolutely every day. The example that Muhammad gives is when he talks to a priest who goes to this like busted up temple and he lights a lamp once a day or twice a day. And he says, look, I do this for me and I do this for God. No people might come to this temple, but I'm still honoring the temple. So that's the bare minimum would be sort of that Nitya Fateha. So what is the Nitya Fateha practice? Well, if a pilgrim comes to do the Nitya Fateha, this is what they do. Oh, and also this Nitya Fateha is also called Namaz. Namaz is the Arabic word for prayer. It's one of the five pillars. And in fact, in the colloquial language around, even Hindus will use the word Namaz to refer to doing practices dedicated to Kalayapa. So again, there's all of this overlap between Islam, Hindus and Muslims. So in general, villagers will just go to the peer house whenever they, whenever they feel like it, just to see the peer, just to see Kalayapa. Or they might, you know, go when they're starting something, or they might go if they've got a problem. Um, but yes, pilgrimage also, pilgrims also come throughout the year to do this Nitya Fateha ritual. So let me walk you through how a pilgrim would do it. Well, a family would come and the father would go inside and say the Fateha and make an offering of sugar in the peer house. And the temple cleric would also say the Fateha and he would be, both of them would be focused on looking at this photograph, a framed photograph of the battle standards because the battle standards and the peers are asleep. They're in their, their wooden chests elsewhere. Uh, the mother waits outside praying for her family. When they uh, come out, then they go and circumambulate the fire pit, probably three times, and then they take a pinch of dust and ash from the fire pit and put it on their heads, just like a Hindu would do at the, when they circumambulate a fire pit or go to a temple of Shiva where you'd put ash on your head, or when they apply, when a priest applies a bindu to your head, that's like after you do the ritual, and they put a little red dot on your head. My buddy Ram always says it. That's the Hindu seal of approval. Anyway, so then to make it weirder, after that, they go to a Hanuman temple. It's a little ways off. And they offer coconuts and receive sort of this blessed red powder from their Vaishnava priest. So these Muslims do this thing for a peer in a kind of Hindu way. Then they go to a Hindu temple and worship a Hindu god. And then finally they return to the pier house and they will offer a lamp to the goddess who's in the temple next door. This is completely Hindu. So this is lots of heavily Hindu practices uh, and practices that would be considered non-Islamic and, and even forbidden, so haram or shirk. But this is a local tradition. So what to do with that? Another practice that they do also, also so here's the Fateha again. Um, there it is, hit pause and read it. Um, they do everyday kunduri. Kunduri means food rituals. So if you want to fulfill a vow to give thanks or revere the peer, folks will go and they will prepare a feast. They probably would do this in conjunction with doing the Nitya Fateha that I just described above. Here, people offer this, a small amount of the food that they've cooked, probably from an animal that they've sacrificed, <laughs> and they will make it into an image of a horse and offer it to the peer. Um, there's probably roots of this sort of shared feasting in general in Telugu culture, the culture of Andhra Pradesh. So women, so how does this process work of preparing this feast? Well, women take a special bath by the pier house and men actually go to do the goat sacrifice in a very Muslim way and not a way that a Hindu would usually do, uh, regardless if they're Hindus or Muslims. In fact, the food is considered to be impure if it is killed for this, uh, this ritual, and it is not done in a Muslim manner, usually with the, th the throat being cut by a Muslim person or by a Muslim butcher, by someone that would um, use proper Sharia um, and uh, 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 proper Muslim food, proper halal food. And then also the third thing is on Thursdays and Fridays, they have folk performances by the fire pit. So these are the things that go on year round or these types of practices. So what are my overarching themes here? Well, it's hard to sort out Hindu and Muslim practices because everybody's doing all the same stuff. And if you were just there and looking, 
you wouldn't be able to pick out who's a Hindu and who's a Muslim. This suggests that religious boundaries are actually really local, uh, are really limited in local practices. When you're looking at how anybody's doing something in a specific place, you're going to see funny overlaps. And funny overlaps are sort of interesting. Um, while people might have distinct authorities, scriptures, religious clerics, and whatnot, when you're on the ground, tend to, people tend to do whatever works. Now, these peer traditions are found throughout India, uh, and this is one local iteration of them. Uh, these rituals and festivals are part of what makes the peer come to life in daily life. The peer is an active presence by these types of rituals and this festival. Uh, it also shows the power and the authority of the peers in people's life. Uh, throughout this, throughout these rituals, people would yell, Din Govinda, which is a cry of glory and victory, but it's a weird one because it's very local and um, it's a combination of an Arabic word, Din, and a Sanskrit word, Govinda. It's a hybrid language that's found throughout the rituals. Some Hindus even call this, this Muharram Imam Jayanti. Jayanti is a Sanskrit word, so meaning victory to the Imam. Victory to, to the great, to, victory to the great authority. We also have Ziratu Darshanam. So Ziratu means like something like holy in Arabic and Darshanam was that word Darshana I said before. And Nitya Fateha, the Fateha, which is the opening of the Quran and Nitya, the Sanskrit word. So there's these hybrid Hindu concepts. Um, likely what this was is when the Sufis, who are the people that really introduced India to uh, Islamic religion, when they were encountering people who were not necessarily Hindus, but people who were Bhaktas, they would actually combine Arabic and sort of indigenous words in the area to pull more people in. So there's a Bhakti vibe that is throughout this. Now, Bhakti is the religion of devotion. So that is uh, having a complete relationship with God and being completely devoted to the God of your choice. But it's a very emotional religion. It's about sort of bringing up emotions of love or separation and thinking about those with the deity, having an extreme love for the deity as your lover, as your child, as your mother or however, but just becoming completely enraptured in that sense of feeling, which is not something you generally find in, in Islam when they are talking about sort of religious figures. There is definitely, Islam is the religion of love, but it is a love for God and for man, not these other religious figures. Uh, yes. Um, so yeah, what we're seeing here is a way that Islam can be can be made local, can be made local in these different places, which is different from what I was calling localized Islam before. But let's not get into that. Um, okay, what else do we see? Uh, we see that, like I said, Sufi was around, and we have specific teachings from Sufi saints and whatnot. But we can see that there were things that the Sufi saints didn't necessarily sanction that existed in sort of the local cultures that continued to be expressed in a thing like Muharram. Uh, folks can actually see the standards. Remember that these um, these images, well, these, they're not image, these battle standards, these battle flags are actually usually hidden away. But during the festival, they're brought out. They're actually present. Folks can interact with them, and they interact with them not only by taking darshana with them, but people pray to them and have like interior conversations with them. So the external experience of seeing the battle standards enlivens interior experiences of emotion and devotion. Um, the peers are experienced as being, so this is kind of an interesting thing. When you're at the peer house, it's the varied peers. You know, they'll list them, they'll name them. When the, they're wandering around, people refer to these peers as being the peer of the neighborhood or the peer of their family. So they go from being a public peer to a private peer. It's kind of, a, it's an intriguing idea. I want to think about it more at some point. Um, I wanted to close by saying that this form of Islam is distinct from the Islam of the Arabic world. It has continuities. It connects to Shiism and Karbala and the Muharram martyrdoms. But it's very different from <laughs> the Arabic world. It's very um, well suited for, the, for, for South India. And it's distinctly different from um, Wahhabi fundamentalism. So Muslim fundamentalists, their biggest critiques are for governments that are not Muslim, usually their own governments, they don't find Muslim enough, and for these types of practices. These are the types of things that drive Muslim fundamentalists crazy and they want to drive out of all of Islam. Stuff like veneration of saints, 
worship at Dargas and these types of religious festivals. So in the end, I wanted to show you something completely different of Islam that, that I don't think you're ever going to encounter elsewhere unless you kind of go to Asia or people start really paying attention to the Islam in South Asia and giving its due as a unique phenomenon and not a necessarily independent phenomenon of all Islam, but an iteration that bears a little more attention. Thank you very much. Um, I have a moment here. All right. See you next time.